But Koufax is hearkening back. He's doing something old world. His glimpse was into the past where the measure of man was something like obedience to God, right? And I think these NBA players is glimpses into the future where the obedience is, is into like something called like their vision of a better life. Hello and welcome to Why Are We Talking About? Rabbits, that's this podcast that's aimed at folks like Neo and the Matrix who feel a deep sense of dislocation. On this pod, we talk about heavy things lightly. We're going to use theology, history. You guys know the rest. And we're going to do all of this to figure out what the hell is going on. This is Watar. Why are we talking about rabbits? And this today is episode number 33, Sandy Koufax, Kyrie Irving, and sitting down. (sighs) Daniel, say hi. What's up? So, Daniel, this is episode 33. What do you know about Sandy Koufax? Anything? I had a Sandy Koufax baseball card, I remember. I remember it was a pretty old baseball card. He was <laughs> yes. a pitcher? He's a pitcher. He's really good at his job. Yeah, we're going to talk about Sandy Koufax today. And I really want people to hear this baseball story. So here it goes. Because I think it has everything to do with what's going on all around us. So on the afternoon of October 6, 1965, the Brooklyn Dodgers, Minnesota Twins, they got together in Minneapolis to play game one of the World Series. Don Drysdale was pitching for the Dodgers in game one. He got destroyed. In the third inning, the Twins scored six runs off of Drysdale. They were up 7-1. They won 8-2. Game one was a disaster in 1965 for the Los Angeles Dodgers. Why is it so bad, and why is Drysdale pitching? Well, he's pitching because the best pitcher in the game on that particular day played for the Dodgers, and his name was Sandy Koufax. He should have been on the mound. The Dodgers were having an incredible year. He was having the best career, uh, uh, best year of his life, 26 wins up at that point, 382 strikeouts, the most strikeouts in the history of the game, except for one year by Nolan Ryan. He had a perfect game only three weeks earlier. He had pitched a perfect game earlier in the year before the World Series. This guy was a monster, but he didn't pitch, right? Game one was his time to shine, but it was also Yom Kippur, the holiest day on the Jewish calendar. And Koufax was Jewish. So what does he say? I'm not going to play. I'm going to sit I'm not going to play on the high holy day. And boy, were the Dodger fans confused. Their owner, Walter O'Malley, he's a Roman Catholic guy. Here's what he said. I should have asked the Pope to send some rain on Yom Kippur so we could skip the whole thing altogether. Drysdale, the guy who actually subbed in for him, reportedly on his way off the mound that day after he had just given up seven runs, he turned to his manager and said, Skipper, I bet you wish I was Jewish too. (laughs) That's kind of funny. As it turned out, not everything was lost for the Dodgers in 65. Koufax pitched in game two. He lost. So now the Dodgers are down 0-2. But guess what happened next? He pitched game five and game seven. And both of those games, he pitched all nine innings, a complete game. And in both of those games, he gave up, Daniel, zero runs. Aren't you a hiker? Hiking? Not a big baseball guy, but this is interesting. So they won the World Series? They won the World Series. He pitched one of the greatest games of all times in Game 7. The Dodgers came back to win. You're talking about an all-time great guy. And so just a few years ago, in 2015, it was the 50th anniversary of his baseball holy day sit down boycott thing because at the time when he wouldn't play it felt a little like a boycott some of the headlines spoke of a boycott but what they really meant was he was sitting down and wouldn't play and it's really interesting to read the interwebs reaction from the articles that are that proliferated during that you know sports articles that were on the interweb in 2015 5 years ago it's really easy, interesting to, 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 to read about them and read them. So what did writers of today say about the 50 years ago event? 
Well, most of them talk about Jewish pride. They, consciously or not, they talk about having uh, Koufax having stood up, you know, against all the pressure and observed Yom Kippur. And they do it as this, in the, in the articles I read, are, are done in a way to talk about how he was out to teach people about Judaism to acquire a type of equality. Just listen to what the Brandeis University historian Jonathan Sarna, he says in an article by one of America's greatest, greatest journalists, and maybe probably the best and most famous baseball writer of all time, David Halberstram. This is what this Brandeis guy is quoted as saying. In the era when lots of Jews thought it was best to keep their Judaism quiet, Koufax, he stood up and he gave Jews all across the nation courage to be outwardly Jewish. He gave them courage to wear Jewish symbols, to demonstrate against Soviet uh, oppression of Jews, and to do all kinds of political events they never would have done, unquote. That's the way the article 50 years later talks about Sandy Koufax. Here's a quote from Sports Illustrated. It marks the 50th anniversary of Koufax's decision to sit. Quote, Koufax's decision to sit bonded secular Jews with the observant Jews and forged a new cultural identity for American Jews, unquote. So in that same article... They quote a rabbi, and the rabbi ends the article by saying, it's one of the best American Jewish stories we've ever had. This is Rabbi Paley. Koufax, quote, didn't see the burden of his identity. What he saw was the possibility of identity. Yeah. What do you think of that? That's interesting. He was standing up to tell people about Judaism, kind of. It's interesting today, 50 years later, that writers talk about Koufax and his boycott as an identity movement and a way to claim his Jewishness. And even if you keep reading, as I did, you'll see, Daniel, that nearly all the articles were bent on seeing Sandy's sit down as a type of standing up. It's like, um, it's like a way to say, right, we count two. So look, do you, would you feel proud if Troy Palomalu was... He's an Orthodox Christian guy. I saw him crossing himself in like the playoffs in 2005, about the same time. And I felt weirdly proud. Would you feel proud if you saw him like doing Orthodox stuff before a game? Or what if he sat out Pasca? Uh, I would be, I would be proud, but I don't think I'd be proud in the sense that the sports illustrated guys are talking about. Um, like I don't, I don't see Orthodox Christians as, persecuted in the same way that the Jews were in the 20th century. Dude, that was an intense century for the Jews. Yeah. Good point. Good point. Yeah. And this isn't to downplay any of that at all. It's, it's try to, I'm trying to get a context. I don't know the answer. I was proud. I did feel like these writers now, but what about Palomalu? Like what would he be doing? And what was Koufax doing? Like how did Jewish folks felt, like, yes, that's our guy. By the way, remember, he's the best, okay? This guy was so good. I was just watching Pete Rose talk about trying to hit Sandy Koufax's curveball. Like, he's really funny. Pete Rose is a nut. He, like, he, it was, he said it was impossible. He had, like, two hits off of him. So when he doesn't go and play, he stands up for Judaism in the way the articles are talking. I just don't know how they how he stands up. So let's keep going because... So does Koufax have anything to say? Yes. Did he ever comment on yes. his, his actual reasoning? Excellent. So here's what Koufax says. Because it's really interesting. He says this, quote, I had tried to deflect questions about my intentions through the last couple of weeks of the season by saying that I was praying for rain on Yom Kippur. See, he saw it coming. He, he saw that, uh-oh, if we're really good and if we play in the World Series, yikes. So there was never any decision to make, he says, quote, because there was never any possibility that I would pitch on Yom Kippur. He goes on to say, Yom Kippur is the holiest day of the Jewish religion. The club knows that I don't work on that day. 
when Yom Kippur falls during uh, during the season, as it usually does, it has always been a simple matter of pitching a day earlier. I don't work on Yom Kippur. And it doesn't sound like a guy standing up for anything. I mean, it's pretty obvious that Koufax was doing his sit-down as a way to honor his faith. There's something about his creator or about the creator of the universe that he's doing there. There's something about the people who God created that he's honoring. I mean, just listen to the definition of Yom Kippur. It's, it's pretty straightforward. Yom Kippur is known as the Day of Atonement. It's the holiest day of the year in Judaism. Its central themes are atonement and repentance. Jews traditionally observe this holy day with a day-long fast and intensive prayer, often spending most of the day in synagogue services. That's what Jews do on Yom Kippur, and that's what he did. Well, there's, there's, a, there's a question whether he actually went to synagogue. But I think I want to talk about this, because if you take this definition at face value, Koufax isn't really doing a sit-down so much as he's doing a low bow. Like he's doing a veneration to his God, to his creator, to his religion. I mean, you can argue he's venerating, and he can't do the veneration from the baseball field. He's trying to get right with God. He's trying to do that thing that says something like, sorry, my real master is not baseball. It's not financial management or nursing or defense department undercover stuff or whatever you are currently employed in. My master demands my attention this day, and my master is not baseball. So I think to make this a, a, a little more relevant, we should take a look at some other recent sit-downs of sorts in sports. You want to? Let's Probably. do it. All right, good. The disembodied voice. I was going to say the disemboweled voice, but... <laughs> <laughs> Gosh, that's horrible. That's like a body triangle in jujitsu. <laughs> <laughs> I'll disembowel you. <laughs> what can we just stop for one second? What is a body triangle in jujitsu? What are you talking about? So imagine someone's behind you and their legs have formed a triangle around your torso and they're just like squeezing you like an anaconda. <laughs> That's a human doing that to a human? Yeah, the worst part is you're not really supposed to submit to that. Like, that's not a submission. It's just like a... What do you mean it's not a submission? What, like, who decided I can't submit to that? A rule? Well, you can, but you're just not going to... You're going to be pretty lame. Like, you're going to be a white belt for a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, because everyone goes, ooh, he tapped out on the body triangle. Ooh. Exactly. You don't tap to a body triangle. That's pretty lame. That's pretty soft. <laughs> if it was Yom Kippur, would you try to body triangle somebody or would you take the day off? Uh, if it's the day of atonement? Yes. Would you try to body triangle somebody if you were a jiu-jitsu fighter, which you are? Probably not. That's not something you do when you're atoning, I, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you're not inflicting pain on other people <laughs> and I think, you're trying to stop that from happening ladies and gentlemen now you know how sandy koufax felt but it is super interesting right that that uh somehow one thing is more important than the other and so you just do the more important thing even well, the interesting thing i thought his response was really interesting like he he wasn't excited necessarily to speak about his reasons for for not pitching like 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 what right. you're talking about with right. a lot of these sports protests right. it's usually like the purpose is for the camera well that's kind of the point i i want to get to in the end or in the beginning or right now which is what is the sit down what is he actually doing so today just to give it a little relevance, we can we can look at current sit-downs. It's actually happening for the last year in, in the NBA, which I love the NBA. So to give this some context, during the last NBA season, players from pretty much all the teams, they simply refused to play playoff games after the shooting of Jacob Blake in Wisconsin. Do you remember that, Jacob Blake? He was the guy who showed up and then was, was going into his van and they shot him in the back. It was terrible. But... After that event, the playoffs stopped because the players wouldn't play. 
they they set out. They prioritize something over something else. They prioritized this moment of of injustice as they saw it over their profession. So they elevated one thing and showed the world what comes first in their lives. They followed in the footsteps of Sandy Koufax, kind of, I think. Here's the kind of part. You see, if you look at the statements from August from the NBA, you can see that there's something a little different going on. So here's from the NBA. Here's what the NBA says about the sit down during the playoffs. They said, this is the official statement. We had a candid, impassioned, and productive conversation regarding next steps to further our collective efforts and actions in support of social justice and racial equality. Hmm. They continue. All parties agreed to resume the NBA playoff games on Saturday, August 29th, with the understanding that the league, together with the players, will work to enact the following reforms. So... Already, the sit-down by NBA players was for something, right? So here are the things it was for. It actually says it. Establish a social justice coalition. Convert arenas into a voting location for the 2020 election, the one that just passed, that really neat one (laughs) that just happened. And then create advertising spots dedicated to civic engagement in national elections. Establish social justice, coalition, convert arenas to voting locations, create advertising spots for civic engagement in national and local elections. Hmm. When the players sat down and wouldn't play, they looked like Sandy Koufax, but they really sat down to try to enact something, which is really interesting. Major League Baseball did the same thing at the same time. And they stated that they would be allies in the fight to end racism. So establish, convert, create, ally. These are all like action words. You don't really hear that from Sandy Koufax. And then there's Kyrie Irving. He's highly talented, highly. He sat out, he sat on numerous games. And this is like up until like last week, basically. Here's what he said out about his sit out. Here's what he said. With everything going on in the world politically, socially, like I said, it's hard to ignore This is him speaking. I want to make changes daily. There are so many oppressed communities, so many things going on that are bigger than just a ball going into a rim. Yeah, there it is. The Koufax moment, right? Something bigger than just me tossing a ball into a rim. Come on, man. There's bigger things in the world. Something bigger than me. It's the same. But I don't think it is the same. Right? It's different. And there's one reason why it's different. Well, there's many reasons. But I think the idea of I'm going to sit down so things can get better is a utopian idea from the new world. It's a new world idea. It's not the Koufax moment. The Koufax moment is I need to get reformed. And I need to get reformed into the image of a creator. I need to be more like the thing that's bigger than me. Kyrie's moment is more like I need to get other people in alignment with my mind's own creation of what is good. I need to get other people in alignment. And by the way, this happens all throughout history. And Christians do it. And Jews do it. We try to get other people into alignment with my mind's own creation. And you can feel the NBA players doing that and they're using the leverage of their stardom. One thing's a sit down for something within. The other thing's a sit down for something without. I think one's like a bow low thing and the other is a stand tall thing. One's kind of like a small person thing. And the other's like, I've got something to say thing. Uh, I don't know if I'm being fair to Kyrie. I find that one is very old world and one is very new world. So I'm not trying to say, Mr. Producer, I'm not trying to say that one thing is good and the other is bad. I'm not saying that. Kyrie and the NBA guys, most of them I rather admire because they're so skilled at their craft. Who doesn't like that? They're responding to the ethos of our day. Their new world ethos 
right? Their new world ethos is normal in the waters we swim. Koufax, whether I think he knew it or not, he's very new world, you know. But Koufax is hearkening back. He's doing something old world. His glimpse was into the past where the measure of man was something like obedience to God, right? And I think these NBA players' glimpses into the future where the obedience is, is into like something called like their vision of a better life. Koufax, I think, sat down more like an admission of guilt, of need, or of weakness. And Kyrie sits down something like to say, you're not going to see me do my thing until you think hard about your thing. I'm not doing my thing, basketball, until you reconsider your thing, which is a messy, ugly life that you, whoever you is, is leading. Fix it, and I'm going to use my leverage to make you do it. Am I being too hard So do you Kyrie? protest the protesters by not watching the NBA? Is that your sit down? <laughs> Why would I turn off a craftsman? This, I never, this is a great question you're asking. Would you turn off a crash a craftsman? What if you found out your favorite jujitsu? Isn't there a jujitsu guy that you like? What's his name? I'm new. I'm new to the to the martial arts scene. But, but I've been it, watching UFC. You have, right? Is there a UFC guy you like? Um I watched the McGregor fight a couple weeks ago. I don't necessarily like McGregor. Okay, good. But, but you watched it. I mean Yeah. Isn't Conor McGregor kind of a guy that most people wouldn't want their daughter to marry? <laughs> I think he's a stand-up guy, man. He has a wife and kids. Oh, I, I, I don't know. I only see him breaking stuff on the back of a bus or something. I don't know what he did. But right, he could be a very bad person doing a very beautiful thing. Whoa, that's weird, right? Is that possible? That is a very good question. But... Let's just finish something real quick about this notion of the new world. I think what I'm trying to describe is a new world way of doing life and an old world way of doing life. And the new world way is super tied into democracy. I mean, it's, it's really the whole point in some ways. De democracy is about demanding, cajoling, influencing, converting, changing people. It's about trying to get voices into the public that cajole and convert and, and change your mind so that you vote properly. It's, it's why we protest, I think, I think. It's, it's why we think we have something to say because we actually do, in a democracy, have something to say. A new world point of beauty is, is I actually think you can get your voice heard in a healthy democracy, I think. But... Here's the trick, right? The protest is making you into a certain type of person who imagines the thing that they want can get done and that that thing is good. It, it forces you into believing something about your own vision, which is it's kind of infallible. I must work on behalf of it. In other words, the vision becomes the God and the God has been born from your mind. Now, what if it is in alignment? What if the thing you're, what if civil rights, which I think civil rights is fantastic, what if it's in alignment with something bigger and better than you and you get into line with that movement and that movement also happens to be in alignment with God? Is that a good thing? I think it is a good thing. The question is, is how do you know? And I think Koufax's type of, protest allows him to know because it's a low bow it starts humbly the other one the other one's tough the other one is a lot of energy a lot of energy aimed at some serious righteousness about how other people should act i just hope you got it right i hope you got it right and i don't know how you know you got it right but i i hope you got it right and you might have it wrong I just think this is a great way of thinking about old world, new world. Now, that you could argue that the old world then you become frozen all the time. You don't know what to do. You always have to wait for God to tell you. And that's definitely a, one, of the, one of the arguments made by the new atheists is what you can do, sit around and have God talk to you all the time. But there are ways to know God's will. There are ways to see clearly. 
There's ways to understand how patterns work. Pajot was talking about it on this pod a couple of weeks ago. There's ways to see patterns. But um, maybe that's a different podcast. So do you think Koufax is cool before we check out? I think he's kind of cool. I, yeah, it's, it's, I like it. I, I mean, the, the nature of his, I guess, sit down is interesting because he's actually doing it for the day of atonement which <laughs> implies that it's like, you don't, you don't press atonement on other people. You don't have a protest that people aren't atoning. <laughs> like that always starts with you. Right. Oh, so can I think you, it's kind of cool. It is ironic. You're right. The angle is ironic that the day that he sits down is the day he actually should never be telling anybody what else to do. Cause he's the one who did everything wrong on the day of atonement. It's about you. What if the day, but it feels like Kyrie is like getting everybody else to atone. Like, hey, I'm not playing until you guys all atone. Mm. And it's it, like you said, it is tricky because you can't, you can't say there's no justified protest. You know, there's injustice and sometimes it's your responsibility to stand up. Um, mm. Like, uh, Pajot had a podcast about the understanding protest on the microcosm of the body where sometimes you take in food and it's not good for you. So your stomach protests and you vomit it out. Hmm. Um, the problem hmm. I think that you might be talking about is that the stomach of maybe democracy is to just reject everything and to be the stomach and assume that, you know, <laughs> you know that everything's right, but maybe we're starving. Maybe that's the end product of protest. We don't have anything on which, uh, uh, right, to hold. We don't have anything, only ourselves. It's only us in the end that ever knows anything. That's pretty freaky, right? Yeah, you're protesting everything. Wow, but then you die. Oh, no. <laughs> Your stomach rejects everything. I, I, I know, I actually think that's an accurate description of the way people kind of take in news these days. Almost, at least I do. I'm cynical about every piece of information I'm taking in and angry about most every piece of information out there. It all seems made up to me. And in some ways, you're right. What's the principle that... Koufax's principle is, is simple. Dodgers are great. It's a big paycheck. But I got to do this. I don't know about you, but I got to do this. And that's the answer. And then someone says, well, we'll do what? I've got to go atone. I've got to go do what my faith calls me because it's what I do because I'm a Jew. He doesn't, you see how all of a sudden all of the thought processes are taking out of it. The, the obedience overrides the reason. It's just what I do. I know, but the Dodgers could lose. I know it's just what I do. I don't know what to tell you. There's something cool about it. Can I can I do the outro? Is it time? Mr. Yeah, dog, do man. the outro. Mr. Producer Man says it's okay. I'm going to the outro. Shenny Skuggy Marjos. That means to you the victory. Often said at the KB table in Georgia, that's our pod for today. New world and old world forms of protest. Watt Tower is produced by Andrew Shork and Daniel Paternos. Daniel is our producer on the pod today. Thanks, Dan. Our pod is brought to you by the creators of First Things Foundation. It's a nonprofit that lives and works in some of the world's toughest neighborhoods. We immerse there long term, try to get behind local people's ideas to the best way of living their life. Share the Watt Tower with friends. Hit us up with a solid review on iTunes and everywhere you get your podcasts. Your love for us helps us to go and serve that vision that other people have right there in their own neighborhoods. Nakvam de Sasa Luego. Peace out.